This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. And I'm here together with my two co-authors. I'll let you introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Adriana Molina. All right. Yeah, so we've been working uh, for a few weeks on this uh, paper. It's the uh, first time we present results from this lab in the field experiment that uh, we helped uh, put together a few years ago now, but uh, we're now looking at using this data to analyze the emergence of institutional arrangements. So real motivation behind this paper is that we find in the literature that much of the commons research really focus on institutions to sustain common pool resource and much less on what explains the creation of those institutions in the first place. So if we take the, the famous example of Maine lobster fisheries, for example, this is an example of uh, fishermen and fisherwomen uh, who have during decades created a lot of their own institutional arrangements for managing their fisheries at a pretty Im impressive and large scale. And to the point where now the state of Maine has recognized many of those institutional arrangements. Uh, we know also from Ostrom's work uh, on not just on Maine lobster fisheries, but in general, her, one of her design principles is that when users are allowed to participate in the rulemaking process, compliance goes up. It's more likely to to have effective institutions that actually sustain CPRs when the users themselves have had a say in, in, in the rules themselves. But that kind of begs the question then, what mobilized the users to create those rules in the first place? And there, the literature, uh, I shouldn't say it's the literature is silent on this by no means, but I would say it's fair to say that most of the studies have focused on uh, the effectiveness of institutions rather than what enabled those rules to emerge in the first place. So another example from Colombia, where coffee growers during decades have self-organized to create this federation of uh, coffee growers uh, with their own brand. And they've set their own standards for what it takes to qualify to become a member of this federation. So members must contribute to the common good of this federation by complying with standards, etc. And now this uh, brand, you may recognize it, uh, the farmer and his donkey, uh, as uh, to symbolize really high quality coffee. And I think Adriana here, who's from Colombia, would say the world's best coffee. Uh, so another example of a successful self-organization. Another famous example from uh, Nepal, self-organized farmer-managed irrigation systems that have for centuries enabled farmers to engage in productive agricultural activities in a very challenging environment. So again, this begs the question, what drives this emergence of self-governance in these cases? So specifically, what motivates local resource users to really invest their time and efforts to create institutional arrangements that effectively govern common pool resources. So is it the salience of the resource? Perhaps the salience combined with scarcity of the resource? Communication? And what about leadership? So some of those are some of the questions that we explore in this paper with data from a, a lab in the field experiment. So if we look to previous studies that have sought to answer some of these questions, identify two really important ones when it comes to the self-governance of forest resources in particular. And we have several general theoretical principles that we can identify. So Ostrom in a paper in 1998 said, when forest users perceive the benefits of self-organization to exceed the costs, users will invest in rulemaking. A little bit more specific perhaps is from Gibson et al. Gibson, McKean, and Ostrom, 
I believe the order is, the People and Forests book, they say that self-governance of forest resources is unlikely to emerge unless users perceive the resource to be both salient and scarce. Then, uh, I believe it's in the same uh, 1998 paper, Ostrom uh, says a bit more, with a bit more specificity, what is likely to affect this benefit-cost balance that users um, calculate when they decide whether or not to self-organize, whether it's really worth it to, to invest in this self-governance process. It can be costly in terms of time, effort. Um, and she says that, well, it's, it is productive to look at the characteristics of two groups of variables, the resources themselves, the extent to which the resource is scarce, salient, and predictable, because those characteristics will influence this benefit-cost uh, balance. And users, when they trust each other, the cost of organization may go down. When they have low discount rates, when they value the future quite highly as opposed to the present, um, that is low discount rates, that can also reduce the costs of self-organization. When they depend on the resource a lot, uh, then that could also reduce the cost of self-organization. When they're autonomous, they're perhaps less meddling from the outside, that could also reduce the cost of self-organization. So this gives us a bit more guidance. So we basically took these uh, general principles from Ostrom 98 and formulated a few hypotheses. Before I get to the hypothesis, I forgot about this slide, but uh, other things that also seem um, to emerge as, what should we say, important factors that has been, been mentioned to affect self-governance, communication, allowing for communication, uh, perhaps uh, having effective communication between forest users can really have a positive effect on this self-governance process or the formation of self-governance. And then leadership, it's kind of a controversial issue, but for the most part, if we go to literature, uh, several authors have identified leadership that can really be important for this a process uh, of rule creation. So if we wanted to summarize what we know and what we still have to learn more about or, or develop more knowledge about, our assessment is that, yes, most existing CPR studies, they really focus on the conservation outcomes. And when it comes to whether or not the resource is being sustained and less on the creation of rules, we think it's really important to to look at this as an evolutionary process. So if we want to be able to one day have sustainable management of common pool resources, that's really kind of an end uh, outcome, if you will. And we should recognize that it's a long evolutionary process to get to that end outcome. And it's quite possible that the factors that influence the rule creation in the very initial decisions and stages of this self-governance process, those factors may be quite different from the factors that influence the effectiveness of institutions towards the end of the causal chain. So basically what we try to do here is to just focus on those initial decisions on rule creation. So uh, the initial stage. So kind of unpacking this long causal chain. Okay. Let's get to our argument then. So we argue that forest users are more likely to create their own institutions when they experience changes in scarcity of a salient resource, when they can communicate effectively, and when a leader coordinates the collective action. So it's, it's a mouthful for hypothesis or argument, but we then, to test this argument, we really break it down into to three testable hypotheses. So we say that changes in resource scarcity of an economically salient resource is associated with more creation of rules. And when groups have leaders, they are more likely to invest in creating institutional arrangements. And the more group members who speak in a, <laughs> in a uh, rulemaking, context, the more likely they are to actually create the rules. So pretty straightforward. I hope if you have any uh, questions or clarification, I think you should feel free to 
to raise your hand in this Zoom forum, and we'll try to address those as we go along. Yeah, and I'm watching Christopher for that. Okay, good. So then, uh, a lab in the field experiment, what is it? Well, it's basically an interactive decision-making exercise. And here, you know, it's popular to do this with students in classes, at universities, but here we, we, uh, we wanted to perhaps get a more realistic assessment of how forest users respond to these type of situations. And so we designed this game. And this was uh, with colleagues uh, from Poland, uh, from CRS in Poland, Piotr Magnusewski, Joanna Stefanska, and Michal Pajak, uh, and Carl Salk, uh, many collaborators. So it's not just us here um, <laughs> who are uh, to blame <laughs> for this. Um, so this, uh, this particular game, the decision-making exercise, uh, had eight participants in each group. And we designed this game with a um, dynamic resource. So in a lot of lab in the field experiments or experiments in general, when it comes to common pool resources, the forest or the fisheries or whatever resource that is modeled is static. That is, after each round of decision, we have a fully stocked resource again. So, we, you know, that as um, I'm not a behavioral economist, but from the outside, that always seemed a bit strange to me. That not very realistic to, you know, start anew in every single game. I know the reasons for it mathematically and analytically why that's the case, but it always didn't quite jive with me to have a, a resource completely renewed after each round. So here we, we wanted to experiment that we were certainly not the first ones to do this. Marco Jansen and Juan Camilo Cardenas, who just gave a, a talk in this uh, forum as well, uh, have, have, have done this. So we, we built on their work to design a game with a dynamic resource. So if the resource is, we'll, we'll get to, to how that works in a minute. So let me just continue the overview of the, the game. We have 15 rounds of decisions here. A participant uses these decision cards. And in fact, one other neat thing about how we designed uh, this experiment is that participants don't really know, uh, don't really need to know how to read and write, which can be an advantage uh, because some games that require people to read, write, and make calculations and, you know, on decision cards uh, will uh, have the effect that some rural folks are not being able to participate. So uh, we use symbols and tokens and actual um, real uh, symbols used in the game uh, rather than just abstract representations. Okay, so here is uh, all these 100 green dots. That's our forest. And that's how we depicted the forest to the participants in this game. So let, let's talk about how this dynamic resource works. So let's assume that in this first round of decisions where each of the group members, they have to decide how many trees would they like to harvest. And the game states that if you have 100 trees in the forest, it's a fully stocked forest, uh, beginning of round one, you as an individual participant are allowed to harvest up to six trees. That's the maximum amount that you're allowed to harvest. <coughs> so in this example, let's assume that all eight members decide to go for the maximum harvest. Okay, that means six times eight, 48 trees. And those yellow trees are now harvested, 48 trees, they're gone. So then in round two, Will there be just 48 trees carrying over? Well, what about regeneration? Yes, we decide there needs to be some natural regeneration. Even if users don't plant any trees to replace these, et cetera, there will be some natural regrowth, especially in these tropical forests where we conducted the experiment. So for the sake uh, of this game, what we did is we assumed a 20% growth rate. 
So for each complete row of 10 trees, we added two as uh, regenerated, which means that the new total of number of trees in the forest for round two of decision is 52 plus 10, 62 trees. That's what the stock of forest is now for decisions in round two. Okay, so here again, um, depending on how many trees are actually left in the forest, the example that we just had, we have now 62 trees left in the forest, which is in this top range. That means the individual maximum harvest level is still six trees. But as you see, when the forest gets more and more degraded, it means that each member can't harvest uh, more than uh, an equal share of the remaining trees in the forest. That's what this comes down to, basically. So, all right. Another important thing about this game is that we allowed communication throughout the game, all 15 rounds. And in fact, we encouraged communication in the sense that we said, now you're free to communicate. Go ahead and talk if you want. You can talk about anything you want. Of course, you can make threats or offer side payments, the, the usual kind of rules of, of doing a, a behavioral decision-making game. Um, and people, participants are free to create their own rules. We said, well, you're free to talk about anything. We didn't specifically mention, you're free to create your own rules. No, you're free to talk about anything you want. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll give you about five minutes to talk. And if they kept talking after five minutes, we said, oh, we can talk maybe for uh, one more minute and we'll cut it out after six minutes. I can't quite recall the details of the timing here, so don't hold me to that. I may be wrong on the specific number of minutes. Um, but then what's interesting, I think, is that we had two observers in the room that observed each round of this game. And these, uh, these observers had a protocol of about 10 things to code and observe. Uh, what was going on during the game? How much communication was there? Who was talking? How many people were talking? And very importantly for this paper, we asked them to code the degree to which rules were being discussed and declared there during each session. So what about the payoff structure for participants here? So we gave everybody three tokens. When we say tokens here, um, of course, these are then converted into local currency so that th the average participant will walk off after this three hour exercise to have about one to one and a half times the average daily wage for the area. So uh, pretty well paid, uh, well remunerated, how do you say it? Remunerate? Remunerate. Yes. Remunerate. yes. <laughs> uh, uh, another important aspect of this game was that, of course, participants earn money from harvesting. So this is a very economically salient resource in this game. It's their only source of income. We also said that there is cost of living. You must pay one token per round to cover expenses. Um, energy, uh, food, uh, whatever, which creates an incentive to harvest, right? Because you need to survive. We all need to survive. Uh, so we, we played this game in eight user groups in Bolivia and eight groups in Uganda. If you look at characteristics of the participants, they're quite similar, strikingly similar, I would say. They're slightly older in the Uganda sites than in Bolivia. But in terms of education, very similar levels of education and number of females. So actually majority of all players were female in both countries. So we have, we have two basic questions to address here. We haven't really talked about the second one much. Uh, it's kind of a side analysis, but how do we analyze the data that we get from these uh, decisions by forest users? Well. We do statistical analysis. Uh, we use the group round as the main unit of analysis. So we really treat this as a panel data set with 15 rounds. And since there are eight users, eight participants in 
16 groups playing 15 rounds. It makes for 240 observations in all. Then we use a linear model, an OLS model with the lagged uh, dependent variable. And we have user group fixed effects to control for uh, you know, some confounding variables that, of course, uh, will always be there. So we do our best to control for those. Uh, and then at the end, we do a correlation analysis about to address this question of whether rule declaration or rule creation actually matters for sustainability outcomes, those kind of end outcomes that we talked about earlier. So it's kind of a side analysis. So let's not spend uh, too much on that right now. Here is an overview of the different variables that we use. So the main outcome variable is this variable that we call rule declaration. It's an ordinal variable. And it is these two independent observers that code the extent to which there is agreement among participants about rules on how to make decisions about the common pool resource that they depend on. So each observer code independently from zero to three. To what extent? What is the strength of agreement among users that there are rules to follow. Okay, it's kind of a qualitative assessment or almost subjective assessment, but by two uh, independent observers and we did intercoder reliability tests and they're surprisingly consistent with one another. They're basically uh, seeing the same thing, which gives us some confidence in, in these findings. So that's our main outcome variable. That this represents rule creation. Okay. We then look at both positive and negative changes in the forest stock. And this we calculate for different time periods. So we're looking backwards. So for example, decisions in round five, we look at changes, we're looking at the trend in scarcity, both positive and negative between rounds three and four. So the previous rounds, but we also go back three periods and look at that separately from round two to four and then from round to four, one to four, et cetera. So different lags uh, to calculate a trend in the change of forest stock as, a, as a, a very important independent variable, a causal variable here that relates directly to one of the hypotheses. We then have a dummy variable, whether or not observers uh, saw a leader taking charge, um, proposing uh, things or guiding the discussion. So the question on our coding form was, can you identify a leader among the participants in this round? The observers also took note of how many people actually spoke up during the decision round. And then to control for time in this, we just had it in the, our regressions, the round number coded. And we have a lag dependent variable for a very good theoretical reason, I think. If you were able to declare rules in a previous round, you've already kind of overcome that basic collective action problem. So you're more likely to declare a rule in the current round if you already done it in the past. So we include that as a lagged dependent variable as a causal variable in the models. So we were to look at, so these are the 16 user groups in the two countries, and they're harvesting decisions over time. So we have here on, a, from, on the x-axis in all these 16 graphs, we have the round numbers on the x-axis. And here on the y-axis is our dependent variable. So sorry, I misspoke. It's not the harvesting decisions. It's the rule declaration that ranges from 0 to 3. So we have uh, a lot of variation. <laughs> And some really weird <laughs> uh, things going on too. You know, of course, you all notice this straight line with extreme agreement on rules in Bolivia uh, from round two or three to the very end. Um, and talked to the, the people who actually were there to conduct this experiment and they said, yeah, basically one leader in the group uh, uh, dictated the rules and, and said, you will comply with this and, blah, blah, blah. and there was everybody was nodding and agreed with that so anyway 
we have all sorts of things going on here, which is nice, right? You have good variation. So if we can see patterns here in, in these decision rounds um, with such great variation, I think uh, uh, that's great. <laughs> anyway, let's jump to the results. How are we doing on time? Have another 10 minutes or so? All right. All right, I'll, I'll just talk until somebody stops me. Sorry, hey. I, was, um, I was muted, but yes, that's about right. Okay, uh, good. Well, yeah, a little, seven minutes. Seven, okay. I'll, I'll try to be brief and, and conclude here. So what do we see in the results? Well, we, we find some evidence in support of our hypothesis. <laughs> when it comes to the, this category, uh, resource attributes and particularly trends of increasing scarcity, we see a consistent result when, when users experience increasing scarcity over this window from two to four periods, we see an increase in rule declaration. And this is significant at the conventional 0.05 level. Uh, and then user group attributes, leaders, rounds in which leaders were present, we see a significant increase in rule declaration. Uh, or more rule declaration, stronger agreement on rule declaration, and also at the O5 level, and even stronger is rounds in which more users communicated with one another. We also su saw stronger agreement on rule declaration, and this was at the 0.01 level. So for a, a sample this small, relatively speaking, to have that high of a statistical significance, I think is quite um, encouraging, gives us some comfort uh, in these numbers. So we have basically some evidence to corroborate or to support uh, our three hypotheses that we stated earlier. Um, so just here's some details about the findings about the scarcity trends. Here we have these different time periods. If we just look at the trend from previous two rounds, we have a statistically significant effect as well as for the prior three rounds and prior four rounds. What's noticeable here too is that when you have a stock increase, not decrease, so reduced scarcity, not increased scarcity, we do not see a positive effect on rule declaration, which is interesting. And in fact, you know, when we started this, we were open to the possibility that, you know, we might see both. And, you know, there's a theoretical justification for that hypothesis as well that maybe people are more motivated by profits than the, the um, being afraid of losing uh, a resource. So anyway, but we don't see evidence for that hypothesis here, only stock decrease. Communication and leadership, we see independent effects here. We also tried an interaction effect and that give, uh, showed some interesting results we don't really see a significant interaction effect. So one possibility, of course, you might say, well, leaders are important because they facilitate communication. And it's communication that drives all of this. Leaders don't really matter independent of communication. It all works through communication. But in fact, we see evidence here that that is not the case. We see no, uh, hardly any. <laughs> uh, specification where this interaction is significant, which is that suggests that leadership works independent of communication. So this effective leadership does not depend on how much communication is going on necessarily. So what is it then that leaders do more than just facilitating communication? Well, they might propose new ideas. They may actually uh, intervene to uh, suggest verbal sanctions or provide some leadership that goes beyond communication. So new ideas in particular, I think are important. And then propose rules, propose things. So how do we can overcome difficulties as a group? Okay. I am, this is just uh, reiterating what I just said. So I'm gonna skip to this last part, kind of an add on analysis. So you may be skeptical and say, well, rule declaration is not really a strong measure of creation of rules. I'll grant you that. There's room for improvement on this outcome variable. But just to show you that 
it does have some explanatory power when it comes to looking at the end outcomes of this game. So it appears that when groups actually declare rules, they uh, will also achieve better environmental outcomes. They will have higher forest stock. This is just done with the pairwise correlation of these 16 cases. So groups that have strong rule declaration will also have higher stock uh, at the end of the game of the forest. They will also have more economic payoff from their forest harvest than groups that don't have high rule declaration. And what's interesting, I think, is that they will also have better social outcomes. There will be less economic inequality when it comes to those forest payoffs when there was str strong rule declaration uh, for that group. So we can conclude that groups that have broad agreement on declaring new rules achieve significantly better sustainability outcomes. I think that uh, it kind of validates this measure to some extent uh, that we use uh, on rule declaration. So in conclusion then, I think we should be open to the possibility that the factors that affect the effectiveness of CPR governance, that is the effectiveness of institutions that ensure longevity of the CPR, may be different from those factors that motivate rule creation in the first place. So for example, leadership, I think, plays a crucial role in that initial process of rule creation, but may be less important in affecting CPR outcomes once the institutions have been created. So uh, future work, I think, can certainly improve on our outcome measure, on how to measure actual rules and perhaps act document what those rules are rather than just saying was there you know agreement on any kind of particular rule that would be interesting um, and then another thing about the finding on scarcity are there possibly threshold effects so in one uh, paper uh, forget which one but uh, Lynn Ostrom argued that it's important that the uh, users perceive that the resource is really recoverable it's not a lost cost to self-organize it's not so degraded that there is no payoff uh, for reorganizing or to, to self-organize, to impose rules, et cetera. So that suggests there may be some threshold effects and that would be interesting for future research to explore. Maybe even a future iteration of this paper. So that is what we have so far and uh, we could really use some help in, in uh, improving on our analysis and perhaps you can help us with that so thank you so so christopher uh given the other audience members are muted i'm going to clap on behalf of <laughs> my clapping but that's from the crowd from the crowd okay um, thank you so we have about uh, nine minutes before the hard end uh, uh attendees again if you join late um we have a q a box where you can type in questions and I'm watching them and I will read them uh, to the audience or to okay. the, uh, the speakers. Um, and uh, so I'm just watching there. Uh, there, there are a couple. Um, one, uh, well, I'll just go sequentially. One is, um, uh, was a question that popped up during the middle of the talk where you had said in terms, so this is a, a more detailed question, I guess, but on the analytic method slide, um, the number of people who spoke you had uh, uh, when you were coding, I think you had zero to three. And the, um, the questioner is asking about, didn't you have eight people? Oh. So why was it just three? Let, let me question? go back to that to make sure that we're, sorry for skipping. Yeah, I think this is a mistake. Um, no, be eight? There, were no, there were no cases where more than three people spoke up? Yeah. Okay, so that's the okay. range of actual value. So I guess in, in no, no instance in any group, uh, it seems strange. And uh, uh, I appreciate the question because it makes, uh, perhaps we need to go back and check, but Kimberly is, is uh, nodding here that 
in no instance were there more than three out of the eight that actually spoke up. But we should we should double check that. That seems that seems strange. But it's, it's I guess I've seen stranger things. things. <laughs> yeah, um, it's an interesting finding or uh, yeah. results of your yeah. data. Um, yeah. Uh, again, uh, I think somebody else has joined in, so feel free to put in questions in the Q&A. Um, another one is, uh, what are your thoughts on how these findings might scale to larger geographic contexts? Um, have you thought about that at all? Um, these are, these uh, games are relatively small, would you say that, uh, small scale um, situations? Um, yeah, so I, I guess the question is is about generalizability to some extent. That's uh, one way to interpret it, yeah. Yeah, so yes, these are just 16 small user groups. Uh, so how does that translate into, I don't know, national policy, regional policies? That's hard, uh, but I, I think Perhaps the value, if we if we want to try to glean some policy lessons from this, I think one lesson would be that for decision makers, maybe in NGOs or in forest services, it's useful to know, first of all, is there any self-governance going on in a community, right? So there's no use in, in creating big national policies if already communities are self-regulating, right? So that's kind of the first step. And but once you know that, uh, as an example, we did a survey of 200 rural communities in Bolivia, and we found that about half of them, about 50% of rural communities in Bolivia, have some rules when it comes to accessing forest resources, some of their own rules that they, uh, to different degrees, enforce themselves. But the question for policy is, what do you do with the, that other half that don't have any of their own rules? So we know that self-governance can be extremely important, but how do you encourage it from the outside, right? And I think it's th th what this paper tries to show is that it is, it is possible to identify a priori certain conditions that will help users self-organize, that may motivate them to self-organize. So for example, is there a leader? Are they encouraged to communicate? Are they allowed to communicate? I mean, there are those kind of things that perhaps policy can help affect indirectly and thereby increasing the chances of self-governance forming. It's hard to to go in and intervene to change <laughs> the forest stock. That would be kind of a <laughs> perverse incentive uh, or a situation where an intervention would affect that particular variable. But it's still an important contextual variable to, to be aware of. If the resource is super abundant, uh, even if people uh, find it very salient, if it is abundant, and they not, don't perceive it to be in any kind of risk, then it may not pay off for them to self-organize, right? So it's, I think this is knowledge that may be useful for people thinking about interventions. Terrific, terrific. So we're almost out of time, but we have um, one more uh, question that I put in chat, Krister, um, I'll read it too. Mm -hmm. um, from Ohm, who I would like to build a system that basically runs your experiment backwards. Would you be interested in live community data? I don't know what running the experiment backwards mean, but yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to be uh, negative and say no. <laughs> I, I think that that would be. It sounds. Uh, yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to entertain that idea if, if I, if, if the person asking the question could send me some more information, and perhaps we can have a discussion um, so, about uh, the feasibility of this. 
Om, I just uh, unmuted you. Uh, we only have a minute, but uh, in case you want to say something, or Christopher, you could put your email address in the chat box, um, and Om could email you afterwards. Om, do you want to say anything really quick? Um, yeah, just that I came to, I'm very glad to find uh, this organization, by the way, it's encompassing a lot of things that I've been fascinated by um, all my life, and I'm very glad to find the organization, so that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> um, well, I come to you from crisis mapping and emergency background, and also combat experience, and I've, over the years, uh, been very frustrated by how big aid is assisting people from on high, and um, have come to a design for a system that basically operates on an individual's needs for their resources, and in a very simple uh, uh, social uh, software setup, allows people to communicate those with each other. And everything that I've come to sort of jives with all the research that I'm finding. And in this type of a system, people would be uh, encouraged to participate because they benefit from it and benefit from collective action. But the key to it that I see is different than a lot of experiments is that all the information, all the interactions, um, every update comes back to the individual, so to provide a sense of agency and resiliency and allow them to collect and collaborate locally before reaching out to a higher echelon of some sort for other resources or assistance. Mm. I've really been working on it, want to build it, and it's very simple to do. I've been reaching out to a lot of organizations, but here's another aspect that I'm fascinated by is that research has been uh, conducting experiments, and what I said, what I meant by backwards would be that given a very simple communication system that can become infinitely complex through you know more complex interactions you would then be able to participate by gleaning data that they offer you rather mm -hmm. than taking it from an experiment so the that benefit sucks. of offering you data is that they would be compensated maybe in a small amount um, mm -hmm. but you have real live information from willing participants um, in their own you know in situ so to speak sounds sounds like a a, a neat idea and uh, to me uh, i may be interpreting it uh, incorrectly but it, it sounds like kind of a idea to have a bottom-up process where individuals participate actively but it's up to them to propose the kind of interventions that that might help them and and to kind of self-select into different areas yeah. I see that as the only real mechanism to help people through traumatic crisis and move on into a different you know, layer. Because if I need a dozen cinder blocks this week, next week I might need a job. And if I just operate off of needs and resources, and yeah. I include my time as a resource and everything else as a need, yeah. I can get very sophisticated interactions with a very basic uh, computing platform. Interesting. Yeah, I'd love well, to learn more about that. Thank you. Well, Christopher, if you could, in the chat, if you wouldn't mind putting in your email address yes. so Om can, yeah, can get that. Much. And Om, I think I've seen you on uh, at least a number of other webinars. It's wonderful to have you joining these. Um, I'm a great fan of crisis mapping and appreciating all you're doing on your end. Um, so thanks for joining this, this, uh, this um, effort we're doing today. Um, I'm looking at the time. I've got to unfortunately uh, wrap it up because we've got the next webinar to start. Um, Christopher, I wanted to tell you, because we have I don't think we've talked about this, but um, I've done work on, and maybe this connects to OHM, um, open source software communities. And in the large scale study I did of 170,000 um, open source projects, I had a stage called initiation and then a stage called growth. And uh, the initiation stage in my data, I found that um, the, the teams would tend to be two to three people and the institutional designs that governed their work were really um, very small and, uh, mm. and, and really social norms, not formalized whatsoever. Yeah. Um, but but as, the, as the team grew um, and as the, as the kind of collective action continued, um, if, if they were successful to keep the collaboration running, uh, it went into what I call the growth stage. And in that case, I saw statistical evidence of, of uh, formal rules emerging. So if you, if you want to talk more about it, I just see parallels yeah. between my work and what you've just talked about. Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. No, but, uh, that, that's exactly the, the argument that is behind this, that it may be, you know, useful to split that long evolutionary chain up into different phases and look at determinants that could be different in each of those stages. 
Yeah, it's terrific work you guys are doing. And uh, your colleagues, congratulations for the well-done experiments you've been running. Uh, it's really a terrific paper. And so thank, I'm very grateful for you giving the presentation and, and showing this, this uh, you said it was the first time you presented this, these results. So that's, yeah. that's yeah. really fun for us. Um, in closing, I just on behalf of the International Association for the Study of the Commons and all the World Commons Week organizers, I'd like to thank the attendees who've taken their time out at either noon or some other hour of the day. Um, and uh, I want to thank Krista and the team for preparing and giving this really interesting webinar. Um, in closing, I'd like to just remind people of two upcoming IAC events. There's one in November mid of November um, being run out of Arizona State University. Um, that's a first IASC virtual conference. And the second is the, uh, the traditional 17th year of the biennial uh, conference of IASC in Lima, Peru in July of next year. And the uh, deadline for paper abstracts is November 15th um, for that that's just got extended. So uh, um, go to worldcommonsweek.org. In the top left corner, you'll see links to both of those events if you're interested. But at this point, I'm going to close the meeting. And just again, we're very grateful for you participating in what uh, may be the first time humanity has ever done 24 hours straight of webinars. So thank you for that. And um, thanks again, Chris and team, for your, your great talk. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.